Watch this. Right now, nothing has been issued from a health perspective that would lead us to cancel events. But we're telling all well, what a difference a day makes. That was Boise Mayor Lauren McLean just yesterday talking about events like Tree Fort. Well, she didn't cancel the event yesterday, but this morning the music festival organizers did. And as you can see by this map here, Idaho still does not have any cases of coronavirus, any confirmed cases of coronavirus. But with more than 40 states now confirming cases, we're in the minority there, and that is likely to change. Meantime, the World Health Organization has officially categorized the coronavirus as a pandemic. So what does the word pandemic mean? Well, a pandemic is an epidemic that has spread over several countries and continents. And as of now, coronavirus has reached more than half of the world's countries. Pandemic is not a word to use lightly or carelessly. It's a word that if misused can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. CDC says U.S. has now reached more than 1,000 cases and more than 31 deaths. And in case you're wondering, the last time the World Health Organization declared a pandemic it was back in 2009 for the H1N1 influenza. As for Tree Fort, organizers said today that because Tree Fort is, quote, people powered festival, they decided to postpone the festival until late September and hopefully maybe save some people from getting sick. The specifics are still being worked out, but what about Boise businesses who also planned on this event? Joey Prechtel spoke with the owner of three downtown bars. And I have to imagine, Joey, that this pushback to September can't be a bright spot for his bottom line. Well, Brian, Ted Challenger has been in the business in downtown Boise for nearly three decades, and he owns Amsterdam Dirty Little Roddy's in Strange Love. And as expected, as you said, this event brings in a lot of people to downtown, so it brings in a lot of money to downtown. Now, Challenger isn't directly involved with the festival, but he still sees the benefits of Tree Fort. He says the service injury industry makes a lot of money that weekend. So think bartenders, waiters and waitresses and more. He says it's those that are the people that come to his bars and spend money. He told me he understands why the festival is being cautious, though. If they if they did and they brought the first case of coronavirus reported in, that would hang over their music festival for a while. So they're, they're playing it safe. I think we'll lose a little bit of, of luster for that weekend, um, but that I hopefully this will pass at some point. Now as for Tree Fort itself, some import, important info to remember, if you have a ticket already, that will still be good in September. But if you do want a refund, you can email refunds at treefortmusicfest.com. Now, Brian, this decision by Tree Fort obviously has a lot of impacts. I was able to get a statement today from actually Curtis Steigers, well-known musician here mm -hmm. in Boise. He said it's disappointing, but obviously necessary to protect the health of everybody. He said he, that he feels for the artist because he said that his festivals are being canceled as well, but he said they all have to stick together and do the right thing right now. This decision to postpone was applauded by both Mayor McLean today as well as Central District Health. Sure. A um, lot, lot of good reaction I saw also on Twitter uh, from Tree Fort postponing this until September. A lot of people in favor of that. Curtis Steiger's in Texas right now, mm -hmm. where you mentioned music festivals getting canceled South by Southwest. Yep. Uh, yep. Canceled Coachella being postponed. Mm -hmm. A lot of things happening out there. Even St. Patrick's Day parades mm -hmm. in Boston, in Dublin, Ireland. In canceled. Denver as well. Yep. So it's, it's affecting a lot of things. Even the late night shows out there in New York City, they're going to start taping shows without a studio audience because of this. So everybody's kind of reacting to the same thing. So, mm -hmm. all right, thanks, Joey. Good news to hear about tree fort as well. But if the coronavirus pandemic hasn't really hit home for you, well, just wait. Just wait until March Madness rolls around. You may have been planning on staying home anyway to watch the games. Well, there will likely be more college basketball fans in your living room than in the actual arenas where the games are played. That's right. NCAA announcing this afternoon both the men's and women's basketball tournaments will be played with only essential staff and limited family on hand. You'll be able to hear every shoe squeak and every syllable shouted by coaches. Not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. So no yelling by fans, but what about the bands? Are they part of the essential? And who's going to be holding up those giant head cutouts for free throws? That's what I want to know. And where are we going to get our devastated fan reaction memes? I guess we'll have to see what happens with that.
An NCAA tournament in nearly empty arenas, it's kind of like university professors teaching or trying to teach in empty classrooms. Kind of, I know. This Friday, Boise State University going online only in an effort to simulate what it would be like should we get an outbreak of COVID-19 in Boise. This is just one day, but most college courses these days already a hybrid of online and in class. In fact, a quarter of Boise State's credits are delivered online and 3,000 of their 26,000 students are already just online students. We sat down with the Vice President of Communications and Marketing, Greg Hahn, and he says even with all that, they have not been at this level online before, and the goal is to see if they can do it. They really have to. How long have you guys been talking about this? We've been talking, we didn't think that we were going to do a test run until just a couple days ago, and then it was very quickly moving in the faculty and the provost ranks. They came, they got together with the deans and said, can we pull this off in a couple of days? And they were like, yeah, we can. So we thought, let's, we have the chance, we have this breather. You know, everybody in Boise and Idaho were a little bit lucky with the way things have played out in terms of the spread of this thing. And so let's take the chance. Is one day enough to see if you guys are ready? It's enough to start asking more questions, right? I don't think we're going to get to a point where we're like, all right, we've got it all dialed in. But we don't even know what kind of questions to ask right now. You know, a student in a chemistry lab who can see, you know, some sort of issue evolving that maybe we didn't see. I mean, we're going to take that consideration in too. So I don't think it's about perfecting it. In any stretch of the imagination, it's just about, you know, can, let's let's do it and let's see where the holes are and let's see where the challenges are and go from there. The university can't shut down, right? We have 3,000 people who live on campus, plus research, plus, you know, there's just, there's just vital stuff that happens all the time. And then in this case, that's why we're doing just this kind of online delivery test day um, while everything else is happening. What universities kind of all over the place are seeing, especially in an area where the virus is, is active and moving, um, they, I think they've had no choice except to say we're going to try to deliver these online and they've had to do it from square one, but they're doing it. And so the more prepared we can get if that has, happens, that ha happens to happen here, I think the better off we are. Are you guys equipped to do this yeah. more than one day? We, yeah. I mean, I think technology wise, we're in a good, yeah, the, the technology exists. Um, the infrastructure is there. A lot of our stuff. A lot of our stuff is on the on, is in the cloud, right? So we used to have servers all over campus, and we were tied into that. That's an issue for tons of emergencies. That's an issue. I mean, we're right in the river, and you're more likely, of course, here to have flood issues, weather issues, fire issues that'll affect it. And we just that's the sort of stuff we need to prepare for every day. What are you hoping to learn by Friday on Friday? I think just again the questions: What do we done? What have we? What have we thought about? Um, where the um, where the where the real pressure is going to be, you know, the immediate thing is, do, are we right? Is the infrastructure, is the technology available to us? Are we going to overload something? Is it, you know, do we have we not thought about how some of these courses might be delivered? And then then it starts to think about, okay, if you've done it for a day, what kind of things might pop up after a week of doing it? What kind of things might pop up after two weeks of doing it? We can do one day without without really affecting anybody's kind of academic trajectory. Um, and hopefully we can do that in a way that will help us figure out how do we do it for longer. Friday, by the way, already the day of the week with the fewest classes on college campuses. So you may be thinking it won't be a big deal. And for some students, you're right. But for others, it's still going to be a little bit of a challenge. So I only have one class on Friday that's going online, so I've only seen it from one perspective. But I know there are students that are more worried about like, oh, I have a test next week, like what is that going to look like? Or I have to give this presentation. And not all students have access necessarily at home to like a laptop or internet. So that's definitely a big concern. I haven't really taken online classes. I'm a little nervous about it. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are getting like their like high masters and stuff and they're like oh how am I supposed to do like my chem labs and do all this stuff while taking it online and they're pretty frustrated. Personally I don't learn as well when I'm online as when I'm in person um, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah so you worried about it a little bit? Um, a little bit just because it's one of my harder classes. I have bio 191 in the morning so it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to learn. Um, while she's talking online and I'm not really sure how that's going to work, but I um, guess we'll see. I think it's a good way to test it out because I think it's better to be prepared and have like a system in place rather than just being caught off guard. And that, of course, is the whole point better than being caught off guard. Boise State's spring break coming up next week, so they'll have that time to assess how Friday went. 
University of Idaho, by the way, will have people in town to see how they're going to do it at Boise State because they're going to go online only for two days coming up on March 23rd and 24th. That's the first two days they come back out after spring break. Washington State University will move all of their online or all of their classes, I should say, online following spring break. And that means there are now more than 40 universities across the U.S. that have moved classes to online only. So there is a chance that Friday's test run at Boise State will determine if they go all online in a couple of weeks, especially if there is a change to the confirmed cases in Idaho between now and then. But as of now, there are no confirmed coronavirus cases in Idaho, and you can get the latest information. All you got to do is just text the word FACTS to 208-321-5614, and you'll get the latest information sent straight to your phone. But if you have specific questions, you're asked to please reach out to the coronavirus hotline. That number also on your screen, 208-455-5411 and a member of Southwest District Health or a volunteer with the Medical Reserve Corps will be happy to answer your questions Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. There's a colorful creature prancing its plumage around the Boise bench. Have you noticed it lately? We have a lot of questions. It was Biden's big night across the gem state, except in Canyon County where Bernie brought in more votes. Have you connected with us yet on social media? You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and make sure you join our Facebook group. Or as always, you can text us 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and better be a good one because we're going to read some of them at the end of the show. Earlier this week, you may remember a mountain lion spotted roaming around Caldwell. A little too close for comfort, but seeing a mountain lion in these parts isn't all that uncommon, right? How about a peacock? Well, that also got our attention, so we sent Kim Fields to check it out. It's like something you'd see on National Geographic. Only this was on the Boise bench in Matthew Peppersack's backyard. So he did what most people would do. He took to Facebook. So I'm inside doing laundry and on the other side of the wall, I thought I heard a cat meowing. Come in the backyard and Kayla's like, we got a peacock in our backyard. I'm like, no way. It's got its back to turn to me right now, but hey buddy, turn around. A peacock in his backyard. I mean, he is full on flared out in my backyard right now. 
Caleb, is this the craziest thing you've ever seen? Yeah. We agree, Caleb. The male peacock was the first time I had seen the male peacock because we've we've got the females, or yeah, the females are over on Nez Pierce. Uh, just running up and down the roads. The blue peacock is native to India and Sri Lanka, but a peacock in Boise? Oh, that there's a lot of wild peacocks hanging around. Really? We think it's about seven peacocks that live anywhere from Federal Way all the way over uh, through the bench. So they're just around. What the crazy, like, that's so beautiful. I mean, you see them at the zoo and stuff, but not in your own backyard. So where did they come from? So a lot of people think that they escaped the zoo. That's one of the uh, rumors that's out there. Uh, we believe that it was an owner who had peacocks at one point in time. Um, they may have moved on, but I don't think that the zoo released those peacocks. And why are the peacocks prowling around on the bench? Matthew has his theory. Um, I think he was just trying to find some love and he found the chickens and he tried the peacock dance on all of them. and. I mean, the Brahma, she seemed to like him a little bit, but no, they didn't go for it, so. So you think he was looking for love? Yeah, definitely looking for love. This guy's in heat on the pro. While this peacock may not have been so lucky in love, Matthew Peppersack should consider himself very lucky. Do you want to say hi to the Facebook world? And you should too, if you ever see one. If you see a peacock, you should maybe go buy a lottery ticket because they say that peacocks are quite lucky if, when, if, if you had the sighting. And apparently there's a white one out there. So if you see the white one, maybe that's your very, very lucky day. Wow, a white peacock out there. We've got turkeys in the South County. We've got peacocks on the bench. And seriously though, if you do see a peacock, just look at it. Don't touch it, just leave it alone. Keep away, let them have their distance. And a large group of them, which is called a pride by the way, could become territorial, which probably explains why they're all hanging out on the bench. But the Idaho Humane Society says they don't really bother people other than that cog gets a little annoying sometimes in the early mornings, I can imagine. Animal control, by the way, will not come get them. So don't bother calling them. Voters more than ever are more concerned with having a candidate who can beat Donald Trump rather than having a candidate who aligns with their beliefs. And that may have been why Joe Biden was able to beat Bernie Sanders to win the Idaho primary so convincingly. Big switch from four years ago. We're going to get the political science opinion. And we want your opinion about anything and everything. Send us a text. That number, 208-321-5614. Make sure you include your name. We're going to read some of your comments coming up at the end of the show.
A bit of the flip of the script for yesterday's presidential primary. Not on the Republican side, no surprise there, with President Trump with an overwhelming win, one that was declared just minutes after the polls closed. But on the Democrat side, Joe Biden squeaking past Bernie Sanders to take the win here in Idaho. Four years ago, though, Bernie was the guy for Idaho Democrats, and he still was for Canyon County voters. But in Ada County, the lack of a caucus may have helped Biden win since primaries tend to bring out more older voters and then more voters in general. Just 26,000 helped choose Sanders in 2016, while about 100,000 voters helped pick Biden or yesterday. Boise State University political science professor Charlie Hunt, Dr. Charlie Hunt, says this time around, it may have also been about choice. What we saw in 2016 as well, I think, was a chunk of voters who may not have aligned with Bernie ideologically in terms of his, you know, more far left views, but didn't have that favorable uh, an opinion of Hillary Clinton. Um, whereas most Democratic voters really love Joe Biden. They love Bernie too, but they really love Joe Biden and they have n not a lot of reservations about voting for him. Um, and so I Dr. Hunt also said the swing could be attributed to Democrats who are looking for someone who would be able to beat Trump in the general election. And they may be more, or there may be more, I should say, who do not believe that Bernie can do that. We will be right back. All right, a little bit more about yesterday's presidential primary. We had a viewer question ask about this. They wanted to know why the Democrat ballot looked like, well, this. 
with all the prior candidates still listed on it? Well, that's a good question. Julian Castro dropped out of the race at the beginning of January. Cory Booker soon followed. So why were they still on the ballot along with Warren and Bloomberg and Buttigieg and the other candidates who are no longer in the running? Look at Rocky De La Fuente. I think he got 22 votes yesterday out of Idaho. The short answer, though, Idaho state law requires candidates to file a notarized statement with the Secretary of State's office removing themselves as a candidate. The dropped out candidates you saw on yesterday's ballot either didn't properly notify the state they were quitting or they were still in the race as of January. So they just thought they'd hang out and see how many votes they might get anyway. All right, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of your comments. Comments like, well, this guy right here, he's a beaut. All right, welcome back to the 208. We're going to look at some of your comments, questions you sent in during the show. Maybe we can answer some of them or at least respond to some of your comments. I hope the Boise State testing online will go well. But remember, it's Friday the 23rd. No, the 13th. I think that was a typo. Yes, tomorrow is or Friday is Friday the 13th. But they're hoping to have good luck on their side at Boise State. Again, it's also the day of the week when most people do not take classes. There aren't going to be as many people taking classes on Friday as there would be, say, on a Monday or a Wednesday. So we'll see how that goes with Boise State. I love the show. The Peacocks are great. Love the show. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, include your name. That might help uh, kind of say thank you directly to you. How about this question? With no cases of coronavirus in the state, how many cases of influenza are there in Idaho and how many related deaths? That's sent in from Arliss. And I think I kind of know where you're going with this, Arliss. We've had this question a lot since we've been talking about the coronavirus a lot. And everybody likes to compare the mortality rate of the flu versus the mortality rate of the coronavirus. And if the issue is, well, the flu is deadlier than the coronavirus by number of people who die from the flu, yes. 
but the mortality rate is significantly higher for the coronavirus. We don't have a specific number because there's still a little bit of testing that needs to take place to get a specific number, but we've seen the graphs. We've seen how quickly and especially those who are a little bit older and a little bit their immune, immune system is a little bit more susceptible to lung issues. The death rate is much higher with the coronavirus, especially when we do not have a vaccine like we do for the flu. So please stop trying to compare the flu to the coronavirus. It's apples and oranges at this point. Hi, Brian, just want to know you. We got the announcement from our son in Malibu that Pepperdine University has been shut down for the rest of the semester and they're having to send our kid home. We're going to check in on that and confirm it, but this person is happy their kid's going to be home for Easter, and that might be the case that check out College Vido. They might start sending some kids home as well, and if they happen to do that, don't expect you get the semester off because, as we talked about with Boise State, 40 universities around the country are now doing all online all the time, and you can just take your classes from home. It's not that unusual, and a lot of these colleges and campuses are set up to do just that. Does BSU plan on canceling upcoming concerts due to the coronavirus? I called the Morrison Center. Next week's Ronnie Millsap concert is still on. Yes, looking forward to it. Can't wait to see old Ronnie Millsap. Thanks, Jeff.